Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted today to be able to speak to the George Lequim and uh, Mark Smith, uh, fund managers at Amati Strategic Metals. So welcome, gents. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having us. Welcome, Paul. Yeah, well, um, it's really sort of fascinating um, a sector. But before we sort of dig into the details of why that's interesting for investors, Mark, I don't suppose you could quickly take us through what the uh, what a definition is of a strategic metal. What it's uh, how, how you actually see it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, for us, the the fund was launched uh, uh, with the focus on strategic metals, and for us, uh, a metal that's strategic is either. It's kind of twofold. One, it plays a role in global decarbonisation, uh, so it's it's a green metal, or it's strategic in terms of political risk um, and or inflation protection. So that's our, our precious metal. So there really are our two bookends to this strategic metal: green metals and uh, precious metals. And, and I guess because sort of the interest is, it, you add in that sort of secular long-term growth trend onto the cyclical nature of sort of the obvious the base metals what well, i mean you're not interested obviously in iron ore and titanium and these kind of stuff but it's the sort of the the battery metals i guess and the as you say the green and the all things electric yeah so i mean for us the the, the two the, the two strong themes are are uh, um global instability political risk um and then uh the, the evergreen nature of this fund is such that we want to tap into um, metals that are used in effectively uh, decarbonizing the global energy supply and, and, and renewable energy is very metal intensive. So that's really the theme that, that the, and the principal reason for, for launching the, the fund was to tap into this, what I think is a long dated demand annuity in, in metals going forward. Um, this is here to stay for 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 10, 15, 20 years, and, and, and we're going to grow the fund into that demand uh, wave coming. And, and just get, is there any sort of quantum on that one at all, Mark, in terms of, I mean, I saw a bit of data, a data point that um, McKinsey reckons that battery metals are going to grow by approximately 30% per annum for the next decade. If, if we put anything like that, or what you, you reckon, you know, there'll be the secular growth onto existing demand, because obviously things are like, copper are used into construction out in China and all this. Sort of, but if you add that layer onto where we are now, I mean, when do we run out of supply? <laughs> well, it, it, there, there, are, there, are, there are so many different um, uh, forecasts out there. Um, but the, the, the overreaching theme is, is the, the, the mining industry is not prepared for this uh, 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 demand that's coming from specialty metals uh, in the battery EV market, for example. Um, Lithium is an example. We need four or five times current production just to satisfy demand that's that, that's estimated to be coming in by 2030. So um, if we stretch the imagination anywhere near a, a one and a half degree pathway or limiting a two degree global temperature raise, the, the, the metal that's needed to 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 decarbonize that energy is 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 is, is multiple times the current uh, metal supply the industry is 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 generating so um we're going to need a a a very aggressive push from the miners and from capital markets to fund these new projects going forward good and then george just on the the precious metal side the gold and the silver what's the sort of like the the thesis there i mean is it really sort of like a an inflation hedge because it I mean, it hasn't really acted as a great inflation head in the sort of like, I suppose in dollar terms, in, in, in pound terms it has. I mean, in dollars, it's been sort of fairly stable of late. Well, it, it really comes to its own as a, a tail risk hedge as well, as an inflation hedge. And in the last 12 to 18 months, we've really uh, seen it underperformance because of a strong dollar and a rising interest rate environment. So you had... Um, in February this year, when the invasion of, of Ukraine, we, we had a lot of speculative money coming into the gold market, especially and silver market. And then you had a lot of unwinding of those uh, positions in the ETF market and in COMEX. So we, uh, it's, it's very cyclical as well. So you, you go through the cycles where um, gold is definitely out of favor. Now we get a situation where the dollar is starting to weaken a little bit. The stocks are completely out of favor and, and undervalued in, in our view, which we haven't seen those kind of values. And then some money comes back in. So 
I think from the fund point of view, we, we're looking at bookending the fund with that precious metals exposure really for the tower risk uh, oh. hedge in, in the portfolio. So we, we think we'll probably have 10 to 20% always in the precious metals just uh, as a risk diversifier in, in, the, uh, in the portfolio. So right. that has its own unique cyclical um, cycle compared to the base metals or, or the uh, battery metals. So let's just let's just sort of like probe that one a bit in terms of uh, nobody's going to hold you on this, George, because unless you're unless you're just sort of like a visionary, you, you, you're not going to get you're never going to be right. But uh, if the gold price is currently about eighteen hundred dollars per ounce, okay, if that's the case, when we go into what economists are saying a sort of recessionary or at least a slower growth environment next year with sort of persistent inflation but coming down. How do you see the gold price? Where, where's that going in the next two years? There's a real, like you say, predictions. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is my 28th year of doing it. <laughs> away from prediction. It's not how we work as well. I'll, I'll get to yeah, that. Yeah. But there's, uh, for, for those listeners, there's a very good um, uh, paper that's just been put out a couple of weeks ago by the World Gold Council looking at the behavior of gold in different. Uh, economic cycles uh, facing the next uh, 12 to 24 months. And in all the four scenarios, apart from a, a soft landing where the stock market's doing extremely well, uh, gold uh, is an outperformer. So it, it tends to be, if you believe we're going to get a soft landing, we're not going to get a recession in Europe, not going to get a session in, in North America, and the stock markets are going to do extremely well, then do you need that, that risk diversify in, in the portfolio? Uh, but in a, in a situation of stagflation or deep recessions, gold tends to perform really well. What really happens as we sort of tipple, tipple over, if, we, if the market starts believing we are going to get a, a sharp recession in the US and, and, um, and Europe, we normally get a sell down in the stock markets. The, all the equities get sold down, but usually gold leads the way out of that and before the base metals fall about 12 months, 24 months later. So this time around, because we had very aggressive interest rate hikes, um, gold came down and was under pressure for a while. You can say it's actually held up pretty well, given the interest rate hikes that we've, we've seen in, in the past uh, 12 months. So uh, um, the way we look at things is we look at our financial models, we've got detailed financial models and all the companies in the sector that we look at. And we say, where's the fair value? What, what kind of, where's the market sort of pricing? It's so negative on gold, but if we're finding very good companies at 1200, 1300 gold price, that excites us. Then we say, okay, that, that margin of safety. And that in the 28 years, you, you get very few chances in life to buy companies where the market is so negative. On, on, so it could come down to 1500, 1600 or lower, but that's already baked into the promise. And, right. and always mm -hmm. there's, there's equal chance that the gold price stays flat. It never stays flat over the next 12 months or goes higher or lower. So we, we're not soothsayers or um, speculators on where the price is going. We just work backwards and say, hang on, the market is so negative. Nobody's looking at this space right now. We like companies that are still generating a lot of cash very cheap on our price NAV or EV to EBITDA basis. And there's a lot of growth potential coming through. As Mark said, we, we're, going, we're going to have to recapitalize this industry. We're going to have to find uh, new projects, develop new projects. And so we, when we look at the, our, our valuation metrics, we really, all we know today is, as you said, on your screen, you've got just below 1,800. You've got silver price just above 2,300. That's all we really know. And if we go mm -hmm. back and say, hang on, um, you know, it, it, we, we, those people who come to me and say, well, we think the gold price is going to come down 20% are as dangerous as those who say it's going to go up 20%. But we work sort of backwards. In, yeah, in sense. yeah. You, you're positioning your portfolio. You can make money, whatever the weather, which sounds That's, good. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, Mark, just in terms of sort of like the, the selection, I, I, rather than actually buying the metals, you obviously bought, you seem to be buying the, the companies, the equities. Can you take us through why that, why is that the case? 
Yeah, principally we're, we're, we're looking for um, investment leverage. So uh, we buy the, the miners producing the metal. Uh, it's effectively, we're investing in alpha. And, and uh, if we invest in the, the metal itself, uh, that's really just a passive, uh, a beta investment style. So what, what we bring to the table as, as managers of this fund is uh, we've got a technical background. Uh, I'm a geologist by training. George is a mining engineer. And we've done equal amount of time uh, in, in financial markets. And it's bringing these, these skills together that enables us to invest in the mining companies. And, and effectively, you know, we, we can understand risk, quantify risk in these investments. Investing in, in resource stock is a risky business, but we're limiting the risk by, by analyzing that and quantifying that. And if we get that right, the investment returns far outweigh a beta return from just passively investing in a, in a metal ETF or the underlying commodity. Right. And I guess if you put in your money into the futures, then you get that contango roll as well, don't you? Which you get burnt, which is, you know, you can't take delivery of it. So Mark, just in terms of um, the sort of like the, the, the equities that you invest in, how can you go for sort of like the small and the mid caps rather than the, the mega sort of, you know, caps, you sort of your, your able miles in, in lithium and you sort of like your, your new yeah. months in, in gold and stuff. Well, again, it, it, it kind of that that decision to invest in the small and mid caps really dovetails into our into our background. So um, you can generate an investment return from the drill bit. You you don't have to to invest in a company that's solely reliant on a rising commodity price. So we're looking for small and mid cap companies that may have a mine in, in operation, one in development, but if they make a discovery, it's meaningful for that company and its share price. And, and again, we generating value through the drill bit. And, and Marty, we, we coined the phrase, get, 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 get boots on the ground. So we go and visit these operations and um, we invest in a small and mid-cap company that makes a, a discovery of a million ounce gold deposit in Burkina Faso, for example. That is meaningful to the company, whereas if it's a BHP or Rio Tinto, they, they make a discovery, even if it's a world-class discovery, it's not going to move the share price. It's, right. it's obviously supportive for their business model, but uh, again, Investing in the small and, and mid cap stocks is riskier, but the returns are higher. And again, as I said before, we can hopefully quantify that risk with our uh, technical backgrounds. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you're sort of like, you know, reducing that risk, you're pricing the risk better than investors because you've got your boots on the ground. <laughs> Where have you been this last year? Then? Have you been all well, over well, the world? Well, uh, we, we try to, I mean, pre COVID, we spent a lot of time on, on planes. Um, uh, this year, I've uh, been to Namibia, uh, I've been to, to South Africa, um, we went to uh, Nevada, looked at some gold assets in Nevada, um, Colorado, um, Germany, Spain. Um, so our differentiator is uh, we get on the ground and we actually yeah, invest in companies and, and, and do our due diligence and actually then go and check them out to say, uh, really, to, to audit them. Um, mm. And you can do that through an Excel spreadsheet and the Bloomberg screen, but it's better to get on the ground. And we, we like to say we, we lick rocks and kick tires. And, and, and that's where we can, can find these diamonds in the rough, you know, that other investors uh, can't get out to site or can't be bothered or, or, or don't have the technical capacity to actually understand what they're, they're looking at. Right. And when it comes to sort of like doing your modeling, et cetera, and you've been, you've kicked the tires and this sort of stuff, how do you actually value these things? If they've got sort of like a, you know, a long term sort of cash generation, I don't know. Let's take, for instance, Atlantic Lithium, for instance. You know, it's got a big, huge, you know, huge, huge potential project coming on stream in 2024, 2025, et cetera, in, I think, is it Ghana, is it, or something like that? I can't yeah, remember. they got, they got uh, a world-class uh, lithium yeah. resource and, in Ghana. And they're saying that they've got literally billions, about $5 billion uh, worth of revenues heading in their direction in that sort of time, in, you know, over the life of the... How do you value that in? So um, we build our own financial models, um, and we work, we work from the ground up. So um, we like to come in and look... For a company that's at least got an initial resource, then I can do my geological analysis on that inventory. And then I can model it up to a scenario where I, I build a financial model. Um, effectively, it's a cash flow model uh, that, that, that really um, disseminates down into uh, net asset value. So we, we, we generally use net asset value and uh, 
and, and cash flow to value these assets. And I can build a, a, a virtual mine in effect in, in this spreadsheet. Um, we've been doing this for quite a while. So we've got a good feeling for the numbers, the input parameters, um, uh, understanding a, a, a deposit, putting in what it, the real cost of production, what the real recovery rates would be. Um, generally, uh, the mine takes longer to ramp up than, than initially uh, projected. Um, so we take all the financial analysis that the company's released on the public market, and then we put that into our own um, proprietary, uh, effectively spreadsheet, and then we come out with a, a value of the company. And then we look and say, okay, that's that's the, the skeletal value of the company. What am I getting for free? What am I paying for in the current share price? Um, exploration upside. So you, you mentioned the, the, the deposits. Currently, it's 30 million tons of 1.5% lithium in Ghana. And they've only drilled maybe half of their tenement area. So we can then start modeling in resource right. growth. And then resource growth transpires into expansion of a mine and then that expansion of the mine expands into cash flow which generates investment return share price goes up so right and then we have a we have a like a, a 12 and a 24 month view on all our stocks so right. we, we have, to have, to have to keep the finger on the pulse um and then when the share price if we're lucky enough it gets to our target price we then re revisit the asset we speak to the management and or we go on site to check uh, the investment right and what's your sort of target price for lithium there? Because I mean, it, the market cap's about two hundred and twenty-five mil. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I've I've got a, a easily another hundred percent return on this company, <laughs> yeah. um, and it sounds that sounds dramatic, but the reality is, is is they've got uh, uh, ground geology doesn't stop at the at the, at the country boundary or the, or the fence line; it goes through. So they've got adjoining licenses in the Cote d'Ivoire. Very similar geology. They're, they're yet to drill those uh, deposits out. Um, they've got a lot of uh, spodumene in uh, north of their uh, current resource. And, um, you know, you look at uh, Atlantic, they've got 30 million. Reality is that they'll probably get up to 60, 70 million tons. Then that's kind of getting to the scale of like a Sigma lithium in Brazil. that have gone the very same way. In fact, their ore bodies are very similar. Um, that's now a four four billion dollar company because they've gone from resource development through to mine production, and they right. should be in production uh, first quarter next year. And you can see that value growth in in, in Sigma, for example, is up eight hundred percent. The trajectory for Atlantic is, in my view, not dissimilar. So when we look around the world, we try and find uh, companies that uh, the market is mispricing or doesn't understand the geological potential or they don't want to take on development risk of mine. And, and Atlantic is that prime example where it's at that inflection point between mine developer and producer and explorer. And that's yeah. where you make the value uplift. It goes back to your point, Paul, where you're saying, why do you invest in these as opposed to BHP? If BHP had this asset, I mean, and they're hunting around the world for lithium, that's not going to move the share price when it is mm. for a 250 million pound uh, company like Atlantic. Yeah, no, I, I also know um, Gervais Williams at Premier Mitel likes uh, Atlantic as well. So I think you're in good company. Now, George, in terms of the precious metals, we've had quite a lot of like, knocks in terms of geopolitical risk because, uh, is it Peter Hambro Mining Company, I think, took a bit of a bashing. It was, it was mining business out in Russia, and I think the shares were suspended earlier this year. In, in, how do you build in geopolitical risk into sort of like, you know, the areas like South Africa, for instance, going through a lot of political with Ramaphosa and, uh, you know, just other areas with, with, of risk. Yeah. <clears throat> As you say, Paul, this this area, the whole mining area is full of uh, geopolitical risk. And uh, so what happened when Mark and I were talking to Marty in the beginning to, to set up the fund is that uh, Paul Jordan, the CEO of uh, Marty, said, look, we want you to adhere to the Freedom House Charter principles. So there's certain areas where we're not comfortable that we invest in, where the tax dollars are going to support unjust re regimes, or where in South Africa's case, we, we have a extraordinary high level of uh, fatalities on, on the operation. So we sat down, Mark and I said, you know, how's it going to impinge on your ability to actually uh, develop this fund and give adequate returns and, and exposure for investors. And we found that maybe it was three to five percent 
uh, of the whole area that we looked at, we wouldn't be able to invest in. So that, that precluded investing in the former Soviet Union. It precluded investing in China, for example, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, South Africa. So we've, we've taken that risk out for investors. And, and even Mali, for example, we, we, we don't invest in, in those areas. So we, it's a constant review, but it hasn't uh, affected our ability to, to run the fund. Just as well, we, we weren't predicting necessarily yeah. in the future what was going to happen in, in Ukraine in February this year. Um, but that meant that we weren't invested in, in Polymetal, which I think is a fantastic company. And I, uh, I know that the, the management team extremely well beat all the assets. Um, and there's great value, but it's something we wouldn't be able to, to invest in. Um, yeah. um, it, it's something that's constant review, uh, been constantly reviewed by us. Um, but in that way, we, we're, not, we're not getting into uh, trouble investing in, in certain areas that geopolitically can be very unstable. Mm. Well, I did actually interview uh, Paul Jordan in January in the, in the, before the Ukraine war, and he he he, su he suggested it could be happening. So uh, he thought yeah. that, that Putin might be putting boots in the ground into Ukraine. He was, he was the only firm manager who was saying it. Now, just George, <coughs> in terms of one company, Anglo um, <coughs> Shati, which I think has got mines out in uh, in Tanzania and um, around Lake Victoria, which actually is not it's just north of South Africa, I think, but. Um, how do you see that business? Because again, it's it's trading at a reasonable sort of eleven times PE. I'm not sure what your cash multiple is, but it's a it's a world's top five, I think, gold producer. Yeah, it it is, and and um, the thing with Anglo Gold Ashanti is that it used to have operations in South Africa. Its primary listing is in South Africa. They they can't remove it from South Africa. So for Canadian and US investors, they're looking at Anglo Gold Ashanti, mm. and. The, because the the primary listing is in um, in South Africa, it forms part of the emerging markets basket. So right. you had the sell off in emerging markets. Anglo Gold Ashanti went down with it. Uh, the fact it it doesn't have exposure to to South Africa, it's it, it's a it's, as you say, it's one of the, the leading largest uh, gold mining companies in in the world. They have some very good assets in in uh, Brazil, in Argentina as well. And, uh, and in Australia. So it's got a, a balanced portfolio. The, the reason why we got excited about this stock is there's a new CEO who came on board a couple of years ago, Alberto Calderon. And uh, we sat down with him and he said, look, I see so much fat in the system that's got to be cut out. They were also taking on development risk in Ghana, the, the old Abwasi mine. Um, and they said, we're going to restart the Abwasi mine. It's a 500,000 ounces a year a producer at full, full production. So the market was saying, okay, let's step back. Let's see you achieving those targets of actually developing it. And um, the result of a change in, in, in uh, leadership, uh, which cut out, I think it's 220 senior managers out of that organization, focusing on their five key assets, we were looking at on a comparable basis to Newmont or Barrick or Agnico Eagle, and the discount was just too large. It's done really well in the last uh, two months. I think the stock is up more than 50%. Mm. Um, but it still trades. I looked at this morning on the EB to EBITDA of 4.7 times. Yeah. And, um, and usually for the big gold stocks, they used to trade on EB to EBITDA multiples of 15 to 25 times. Wow. That's, when, that's when they had a lot of growth behind them. Obviously, mm. they're mature assets. But when you're comparing a new model or barrack, which is 10 times cash flow, and yeah, you, you pay 4.7 times cash flow, and you're getting a ramp up in, in uh, Abwasi, uh, particularly, that, that makes us quite interested in investing in, in, in the stock. Yeah, no, it sounds has also got it says a lot of self-help measures there to reduce its cost base. And therefore, you know, you put, if you can reduce the production, then you don't need any increase in your gold price to make better margins, do you, to drop to the bottom line? And that, and that valuation drops even further. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I, I think because they were going through that restructuring, their cost base all in was around $1,300, $1,400 an ounce. Mm. And when the market's negative on the sector, it's saying, oh, you know, the gold price is 1700 1600 and these guys all in, but now they're bringing their cost down to 1200 below 1200 all in cost, which is comparable to, to Newmont and, and, and Barrick. So then it comes into its own. And I think some money is coming back into the emerging market. So, so that's helping to, 
to yeah. have done with. So we we're always looking at relatives. We're looking at absolute value on on the some of the larger ones. Mm. And now, Mark, in terms of um, sort of like EVs and, and and batteries, there's one really interesting one as well. Another one, which is uh, Talga Talga Re- uh, Resources, which I understand has got a sort of like a, a <coughs> it's building out it's sort of a graphene type um, anode uh, development and mining out in Sweden of all places. And do you want to take us through the thesis on this one? Because I don't think investors have really sort of like um, realized the importance of graphite and, and the production of it and the, you know, the, the, the treatment and been able to, and the energy security associated with it. Yeah, yes, you're spot on there. Um, so when we were looking around uh, and, and forming and, and building out the portfolio, um, lithium had started to, to take go on a bit of a tear. Um, but then we looked at the, the chemistries, the batteries, and said, actually, forget about lithium, although we, we invested in lithium or nickel or manganese or cobalt on the cathode side. On Let's look at the anode side of the battery. It's graphite. And, and one thing that we found doing our, our site visits and our DD is it's really hard to recycle anode graphite once you've made it because you change the crystallography of the graphite you can't then go backwards and recycle it. So you can use synthetic graphite. Chinese are very dominant in that market, but it's got a really high carbon footprint. So we're always thinking about that side as well as the mining on the, the carbon footprint side and the, the ESG and environmental side. So we looked at the, the Tauga and you can just invest in a miner, but if you invest in a company like Tauga that's vertically integrated in the business mm. supply chain, so from mine to market, they produce, or they're, they're going to be mining um, one of the highest grades, 25% contained carbon in the graphite in Sweden, as you pointed out. It's one of the world's largest, uh, uh, highest grade deposits. They then can actually uh, manufacture their own anode material and, and, and benefit in that value uplift of the product. So mine to market. And then as an investor, I'm investing in the demand for graphite in the EVs, but I'm also benefiting from their effectively their material science division of the company as well. And you put the two together, they're in control of their destiny because they are their own offtake. And then they can sell that product into the market and not just sell flake graphite or, 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 or fine graphite. They can sell a, a finished product. And then the value uplift is three or four times. So, you know, if you look at Targa, we've got oh, just under 3% weighting in that company. Um, Sweden's a, a low risk jurisdiction. Um, and they've got their, um, their battery uh, manufacturing and material science de- uh, department as well in, in Germany. So and in Cambridge, in Cambridge. Um, so that's that's kind of how we like to play the, the investment in, in the EU. Yeah. And, and, and I'm guessing in Europe wants to get away from sort of like dependency on that type of material from China, doesn't it? So uh, it's quite keen. Well, to I mean, well, you know, in the last in the last. Resource nationalism was kind of happening, uh, but with the war in Ukraine, it's just focused mines and wallets. And um, now we're seeing the world's effectively been split in two and, and Western markets now want their own resource security. So uh, Europe is, and, and the US is seen with, with Biden's uh, um, IRA Investment uh, Reduction Act. Uh, he's trying to control the destiny of, of resources for his own consumption. And mm. China's uh, Canada is doing the same, so um, it's an exciting area. And if you can, if you can find world class deposit in Scandinavia, Europe, where the processing hub in in Germany and all the auto manufacturers and the OEMs are building out there, you know that's a place to invest. Again, low political risk, high return. Yeah, and is there any sort of substitutional risk in, in terms of sort of like when it comes to EV metals? Just because I did see a headline that Microsoft is investing in sort of like silicon anodes for um, EVs, and and obviously it's a long term thing. But in, in most sort of commodities, you never even think about substitution metals. But with EVs, with in terms of performance and better charging and faster charging and all that kind of stuff, is that a risk that you have to bake into your modelling? I, I, yes, I mean, you look at where uh, lithium prices are at the moment, lithium carbonate is $80,000 80, mm. a tonne, uh, lithium hydroxide is pretty similar. Uh, that's not a real long-term sustainable price. So that's going to generate and stimulate so much supply that it will depress prices because that supply will hit mm. the market. So when we, when we look at uh, all the commodities and we use long-term sustainable prices, as George tapped on at the beginning of the interview um 
we put that into our models. Um, but from our analysis with lithium, we're in a real squeeze for the next eight, 12 to 18 months. And um, the, the price I see on the screen is, is, is justifiable on the spot. Um, reality is the demand pool for EVs going forward. And if, even if we, we look at 50% market penetration in EVs over the internal combustion engine, the demand for that metal in those batteries is such that you're going to need a mixture of chemistry. So mm. Elon Musk with his lithium um, iron flow batteries, uh, you've got your nickel manganese cobalt, um, you've got your sodium iron, which we touched on, and Microsoft were looking at the um, silicon, but actually it, it, it's silicon and they blend it with graphite. And um, right. one of the things that uh, we've got to get over at the moment with silicon is that when you try and coat it, you actually, you create uh, a bloating in the silica, it absorbs too much uh, uh, of the uh, chemical slurry when you coat the anode to make the, the, the battery. So um, graphite is still needed in all these chemistries. So that's a common denominator. Uh, cathode is all mixed metals, but as we said, we, we've invested across all these to hedge our bets in effect. But right. graphite on the other side. So we, we're quite confident with a 10% weighting in the funding graphite. Yeah, good. Now, George, just in terms of sort of the silver side of it, we've got um, um, Fresnillo, which is obviously a big, you know, sort of Mexican silver producer, and it does obviously gold as well. How, how do you see that one? Because it's, it's, it's sort of like, um, again, I mean, it should be a, a perfect play in terms of the, the sort of, you know, the precious metals. Yes, but it, it, it went through a tough time. Um, there was changes in, in uh, labour laws in, in Mexico, right, which necessitated that they had to reduce the number of, of contract laborers. And um, typically in Mexico, but Fresnillo, uh, trying to work to the letter of the law, said, well, we've got a high degree of, of contract laborers working at our, our operations. And they had to give them full employment. Some of the contract laborers said, well, we prefer working as contractors. Do you know why? Yeah. yeah. And, um, so there was a, a, a quite a, a big disruption in the productivity of the the assets themselves um, through this this process. They, there's a number of senior managers had retired as well from the operation. So if I look at, at uh, Fresnia from a few years ago when it was the market darling and used to trade at yeah. net asset value, if you remember a few years ago, we were we were never invested in this uh, through this fund or through through the previous funds that we we've run. We just didn't see the value. But then through this process, and um, we were also invested in a company called Mag Silver, mm. which holds 44% of the new Juan Cipio mine right next door. Um, I've been to all the Fresno operations. I've actually been when it was just moose pasture, Juan Cipio, and uh, Fresno owns the other 56%, but it's right on their doorstep. So they were waiting on, they had finished the capital on this project, and they were waiting for the final clearance to turn on the, the processing facility at Juan Cipio. Meanwhile, they were stockpiling ore, and they said, well, it's extremely high-grade silver. Let's feed it through two of our nearby plants, which are two of the, the main plants for Fresnia, which caused in itself disruptions to Fresnia because you, you're treating third-party material through assets that are your, your own as well. And this all resulted in the stock price being under uh, pressure because they weren't delivering against what they said they would do. And that's where we got really in interested and we said, okay, look at this asset. Like you say, it's the, the world's largest single uh, primary silver producer doing about 60 million ounces of, of silver mm -hmm. per year. And you look at, at the silver price of $20 or and the gold price, because remember these assets are almost 50-50 gold and, and yeah. Um, and the price to cash flow multiple was close to three, four times, which for such a large operation, it just didn't make any sense at all. So we spent a lot of time with management trying to understand exactly what the mining challenges were, how they're going to overcome that. What's the timing of actually getting on a CIPA, which is now being commissioned as we speak. And looking, the markets always look forward in, into 2023. It's now the estimated grade on Quanticipio is far greater than they'd, they'd anticipated and given to the market. Everybody's now starting to readjust their, their moves and saying, okay, 
getting the productivity benefits coming through. The grade is a lot higher. So the cash flows and the revenue next year is going to be higher than, than what you thought. So you, you get these pockets of opportunity to buy a really good company, a very large company that's just going through the fears of uncertainty. As Mark pointed out, where our where we feel most comfortable is when there's uncertainty that we're trying to really understand. And Mark is shying away from investing in, in this company. And that's what right. Great. George, actually, could you speak closer to the um, the microphone if you yeah. get a chance you next time? Now? Yeah, I can hear you better. Yeah, you were just sort of like getting sitting out and you sort of like give you your microphone to pick it up. Um, just talking to, just moving to sort of like the, um, energy and um, all things sort of like uranium, uh, Mark. Um, do you want to take us through um, Cameco? Because I know Patrick Armstrong at Plumini likes these guys as well as being an undervalued asset. And uh, I'm guessing they are really well set up for the whole sort of like um, increase and in growth in, uh, in nuclear with uh, small form sort of generators and uh, just the industry as a full stop. Yeah, I, the, the principal reason for investing in uranium is... Uh, you can't have renewable energy rollout globally without a base load power and mm. politi political wills decided to cut off oil and gas. So uranium has to be now front and center. And, and we just wanted to get a toe in, in, in the uranium space. Uh, Cameco, I think we've got about two and a, two and a half percent investment in that company. Um, and it's one of the world's largest uh, producers of energy fuel. Uh, I think it's produced over 30 million pounds of uranium concentrate a year. But again, it goes to the point of being a vertically integrated business. They have now got a, 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 a fuel service division, which is vertically integrated from mine to market. So like you say, they, they can participate now in, in producing fuel for small modular reactors. Uh, they've got the, the IP now for uh, building and, and rolling out uranium uh, plants around the world through their uh, fuel service uh, business. So. Again, uh, they've got the world-class assets and they've got the upside integration into the energy market. And um, uh, it's uranium, and George will, will back me up here, is, is the, the market is exceedingly complicated. There's a lot of pools. Forget the spot market in uranium. It, it's driven by contracts and, um, mm. and, 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 and really the, the will of the utilities to come back into the market. And um, what we've had is the spot uranium trust that's trying to squeeze the market from the from the spot market perspective and force the utilities into the market on long, longer term contracts. Uh, uranium's gone up a little bit, it's you know, $55 a pound. Um, Cameco is gonna be rolling out and, and, and their, their plants are maybe 50% utilized. So when we get a demand pull in uranium going forward, um, what's a real number for uranium? Maybe 70, $80 a pound. Um, that's kind of the figure that we need to bring new mines on stream again. And being Cameco is one of the world's largest and they've got existing capacity and they've got mines that they can bring back on stream. I think that's a good way to play the uranium market. Um, and, mm. that's, and there's liquidity in this name as well. What, what is it important to be sort of vertically integrated in uranium? Because I mean, obviously, having just bought that 49% in Westinghouse Electric with all, all yeah. things sort of nuclear servicing and world-class expertise there, what, what's the sort of the argument for being vertically integrated? Is it, is it like the integrated oils, just to get that level of sort of like assurance through the supply chain? Yeah, but the, they, they have now got licence to, to produce uh, fuel rods. And uh, right. it, it's... If you don't have that ticket to, 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 to trade, you're not going to be at the table. Um, and so Cameco has really protected it and, and controlled its destiny going forward. And that's now the, the fuel service company to, to go to. Um, and again, it, it goes into that uh, resource nationalism uh, angle that uh, with what's going on in Russia now and, and, and Iran and China, um, this is the way that Western markets can 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 invest in and, and, and also be, be invest in a company that you can trust as well. Right, okay. Now, Ru um, Russia, sorry, Paul, I just want to interject here. The Russia, um, they, the conversion process of uranium, Russia controls 40% of it. Right. So you can see exactly what's going on. So the conversion price, the converted uh, uranium price has been going through the roof. All those U308 has done okay, and it's sitting around 48, 50. Um, but it's that portion that 
Cameco will get more exposed to. We, we can't, we've been too complacent in a globalized world where there's too much concentration on the conversion process of uranium in Russia, which has got to move to the West. And, and that's what, what the Cameco are tapping in as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the energy security story long term. Yeah. Now we, we've talked. Now, George, we've talked about um, sort of your two fairly large sort of like you know gold and gold and silver mines. What about um, Hostchild? It seems a sort of the lower end of the sort of the, uh, what should we say, the smaller end, not the lower end, the smaller end of the sort of the food chain at about sort of four hundred million dollar market cap. Do you want to take us through that one because it's, it's a Peruvian miner. Um, yeah, it is a Peruvian miner. They, they've got a project that they're developing in in Brazil as well. Yeah, the and Inca so, Trail. Uh, that's well. It, it, or it's we we followed that that uh, process for for a long time. Um, yeah. The the previous owner of that that project uh, fully permitted. It's it's going through development. It's not the uh, the biggest project in the world, but it's it's probably be developed on time. Um, we'll see on on the, the budget side. But the market mm. is putting no value on on the Brazilian project right now. Mm. Um, the if you look on the valuation side, it's it's about uh, 0.3, 0 0.4 times net asset value because of Peruvian risk. They they've obviously had an upheaval, a political upheaval in recent weeks in in uh, in Peru. We we spent some time with uh, Peruvian uh, CEOs in Lima just to really understand what is going on on, on the ground. There's there's blockades yeah. on certain mines. Uh, in general, in in Peru, and and they, they use in the political will to to uh, clamp down on on some some of the issues going on. Um, but as we speak, the 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 operations are still mining and processing. So the market sells it off on the news as uncertainty. Uh, it's got three operating mines, and um, so there's a bit too much risk for us. We we see it's dirt cheap. It's we we see a lot of catalyst for unlocking value over the next 12 months but we're at the moment we're holding a one percent waiting yeah okay we, we we're monitoring mark uh, said about uh, earlier about finger on the pulse we're monitoring this very very closely we know the assets we we look at our, our uh, financial models that tells us one thing but then this sort of uncertainty how do we bake in this uncertainty we've seen it time and time again in latin america and africa you get these political upheaval things settle down and then, then we we move forward. So it's one that it, it's sort of very puzzling to it's not only myself to other mm. managers in the UK and sit there and say this this company is too cheap. But there there is that underlying uncertainty of what what what's going on in um, uh, going on in, in Peru, and that that's got to be it's got to be sorted out one way or, or another. Yeah, we think well, um, but we just it's it's a bit of a high risk, but it's it's a decent sized producer. It might look at small cap, but the, again, you look at the exploration upside at the existing mm -hmm. operation, you look at de-risking of the project in in um, Brazil, you look at the, the earning on the SNP mine in, in Canada and British Columbia. Uh, these are all pockets of, of unlocking value for the company over the next 12 months. Mm. Yeah, you can, it sounds like you, you can put the expertise of the, the alpha layer on top in terms of understanding the geology, the, the cost dynamics, the production, the life of the asset and all that kind of stuff. But, but frankly, nobody knows what the government's going to end up doing. In, in a, it, just in the UK, in fact, a lot of the time <laughs> with the trustonomics, you know, these things yeah. happen, don't they? It's impossible to tell. Now, um, now, Mark, just turning to sort of all things um, nickel, um, Centaurus Metals. How does this one play? Because that's a sort of like Australian sort of like minerals explorer, is it? I mean, yeah, uh, Centaurus uh, ooh, got about 3% in the fund in this uh, exciting nickel sulfide yeah. developer. So they, they've got an asset in Brazil. It's so far delineated about 100 million tonnes of nickel at 1% grade nickel sulfide give you an example why we're excited about that the average grade of a nickel deposit globally is about 0.4 or 0.5 percent right. they've got a 100 million tons grading one percent and, and and within that resource there's some really high grade uh deposits um so we look at this company uh and they've scoped out a project an open pit and underground uh uh mine scenario uh within with a, a value of about 2.2 billion Australian dollars of, of, of value uh, at about $10, $10 a pound nickel. Um, company's currently 
three, four hundred million, maybe something like that. Yeah, so it's, that's right. It's about point, point three times NAV. And again, we like to get things for free in our in our in our investments. Uh, they've only drilled half of their tenement area, and if you look at the, the geophysics, so that's the, the structural uh, interpretation of what's going on under the ground through through airborne magnetics and, and, and geochemistry. You can test the, the chemistry of the soils, gives you an idea of what's sitting underneath your feet. The indications are that this ore body continues across across the fence into their other ground, and they've only drilled half of it. So I'm looking at this and saying. They've got uh, they've got a mine here. Uh, they're, they're scoping out. They're, they're they're developing. It's 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 a, over two uh, two billion dollars of value, and I'm getting. I think this ore body will grow uh, with additional exploration drilling, and I get that for free as well. So not only am I getting the value uplift from this company developing this asset into a mining scenario, the fact that it's super high grade um, and they've got a, a, a very large endowment, 100 million tons. Then we might get the MA angle. So we might get a, a Rio Tinto or a BHP. And it goes back to that first question you posed. Why not invest in them? Well, we invest in these because these are the prey for the BHP and the Rios. Right. So it's quite an exciting story. And again, given the high grade nature of this deposit, it's got a low carbon footprint. We have to mine less tons to get more metal. So there's, it's, there's less energy mm. intensive industry. The market likes low carbon footprint metals, especially the, the auto manufacturers who put that metal into the cars. How much M&A is there of the small caps or mid-cap um, resources sector? Because it doesn't seem as, as much so the tech area, but um, I could be wrong. Yeah, it hasn't. I mean, it's just starting now. Um, we've had a few deals in the gold space. Uh, we've had a couple of our companies in the, in the battery metals taken out. Um, but it, 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 it's what's playing out is, is the, the industry, to really understand it, it peaked in 2012. That was when... The, the investors were, were throwing money at, at CEOs and saying, listen, I want growth over value. I want growth over margin. And then what happened is the industry peaked and boomed. And then you had all these mines that bought on stream that shouldn't have been. And it's taken the next 10, 12 years to pay down the debt, which they borrowed to build these mines, which shouldn't have been on stream. Now the investor saying, actually, just give me a dividend. Give me my money, but I don't want you to put that excess profits back in the ground when they should be because we've talked about what's coming down the road in terms of demand. So the CEOs are very scared to make another corporate deal yet, but right. you can see the demand annuity that's coming from the decarbonization and the renewable demand that's coming. So we're just, we, 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 fortune favors the brave and we're gonna see a few more CEOs saying, actually we need to do m and now rather than later because the, the price of these assets is only gonna go up. So and can they, can they fund that? Now. Can they fund that, uh, Mark, in terms of the, but, the cost you know, of capital? Most, most, most of these mining companies are in such fantastic shape, the market doesn't really realise, you know, they've paid down all their debt because they had to. They've restructured their balance sheets and they're getting 15, 20% free cash flow yields on most of these operations because the mines are, and all metals is, is we're, we're sitting in a very good place in terms of metal prices. Um, and you've got that discipline at the moment in the miners where they're, they're not spending. So... Okay. There is money here. And then the other side of the, the, the equation, always the other thing as well, these, these companies will never be able to finance their, their mines. They need half a billion dollars or a billion dollars to build this fantastic deposit. What's happening now is the auto manufacturers are being banks in equity markets. They're lending now because they don't want to make money on their investment. What they want is the metal. So mm. Elon Musk, for example, with Tesla, is actually buying into nickel mines. Um, uh, LG are doing the same. Uh, the the um, uh, Calx, the battery manufacturing China, is buying up, and, and they're they're effectively being a vendor financer to the mines. Yeah. They just want metal over 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 investment return in that asset. So these these mines are now getting capitalised, which is really encouraging. And what sort of timescales do you look for your investments? Into if you look at a sort of like a long duration asset, I don't know, Atlantic, for instance, and yep. what's just, when you go into it, what what are you looking to get your money back or, or a good return? Are you, are you doing a sort of like a three to five year type view, or, or, or what? Yes, well, it? It, it, it's a constant iterative process. So we've got twelve and twenty four month targets on the portfolio. I'm looking at here on the right hand side gives me an indicative return of each stock and actually what the portfolio could return in the next 12 to 24 months. So ideally, we want to be in developers within, we, we can see a pathway to production, and that means a pathway to returning capital. 
to the investor. Um, so maybe two to three year development timeline is realistic. Anything beyond that, if it's mm. a five year, that gives too much scope for problems to creep in or, or permitting issues or changing markets or whatever. So ideally we like you know, within a three year window to, to see a, a, an asset be developed and get into production. And then it could be another year or two before the market really gives full value to, to that example, uh, to that mine. So one example, uh, K92, we haven't touched on. Yeah, that, that, that was exactly what I was just going to go on to, K92. But, but, but before one, we... But before with exactly that, 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 cool. that one, that just an example, and you can touch on is is that's a long dated investment which we got in from we, we invested in the ore body, and now mm. they're they're building the mine and they're expanding the mine, and George can uh, can yeah. elaborate but, on that. But before, that we, but before we but before but before we do that, you just you just wet my appetite there, um, Mark, and I'm sure investors. You've got this spreadsheet which says your returns. You're looking for the twelve to tw- twenty four months. What does it say at the bottom? <laughs> give oh, us a, oh, give us a mean, feel. I, I'll tell you, um, we've got 120% upside on the portfolio over the next 12 months if the market's behaving. You know, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, yeah. we've every stock we have in it, in this portfolio has got a financial model behind it. We've analysed it. Uh, we've put in long-term, sustainable, conservative pricing model assumptions. So that 120% return on the fund that we're looking at, I, I'm not reliant on higher metal prices. All I'm saying is the market should then move into a phase where they actually recognize value and, and, and appreciate risk or value risk in the way that we do it. We're looking at these investments. So um, that's a, to my say that's a conservative return on our fund. And that's the talk of the fund. That's the alpha in the fund. That's the nature of how we structured this, this fund is we've got some exciting lithium. Uh, we've got some exciting battery metal sectors, but we're also hedging it with the gold and precious metals. So if there is a recession, and you, you, t- you touched on it that the, the, the industrial metals could come down through you know any recession or stagflation. That that underperformance in the fund will get soaked up and, imp- and, and, and and taken up by the precious metal, the other bookend to the fund. So that's that's the evergreen nature of, of, of this fund. Yeah, yeah, it does sound as I was saying the fund is uh, is fifty percent undervalued there, so uh, with hundred yeah. percent upside at least. Now, George, just just finally then moving to. Um, to K92 um, mining. You'll take us through this one because it, they've got is it not mining to put gold and silver in, in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, that's just a very interesting uh, story as, as Mark pointed to get out because it really plays to, to uh, our skill set. Um, this is in, in our previous life, we, we, we got in very early at, at, the, at this, this company. It used to be a barrack asset. So yeah. um, barrack ran into some social issues in Papua New Guinea. Um, the, the general manager at the time started putting out some drill holes to see what was ahead of them. And there was a couple of really spectacular uh, drill holes. But Barrick at the time said, we're out of Papua New Guinea. So um, they just left it there. It passed on to somebody we knew uh, very well from a previous company. He said, have a look at this company. There's also a Barrick uh, a board member who we knew well. who we went onto the board of, of K92 and he said, Look, this is a very interesting company. We got out because if you re- recall a few years ago, Barrick had some, some big issues in their balance sheet. They yes. had to sell assets to, and this was part of the, the sell process. So this is where uh, nobody was looking at this company. The, um, the, the CEO came through through uh, town. For um, Mark and I, we, we sat down with him, went through and said, this is really interesting, what you've got on the, on the uh, uh, head of yourself, geologically speaking. And what they've really done is that even in 2017, they had 2 million ounces measured, indicated, and inferred. Today, that's going to have gone up to 16 million ounces. Wow. Okay, so that, that's the, the scale of what they've already discovered. And that excludes some of the porphyry targets, which we were particularly excited about. So this is an area with 870 or 830 square kilometers of exploration ground. They've turned that operation. They, they were 47,000 ounces a year. Uh, this year, they'll do about 140,000 ounces. Then they've got phase three and phase four coming, coming, coming through, fully funded from cash flows. They will take them to half a million ounces. So 16 million ounces resources, half a million. It now becomes a world-class asset. We wouldn't be surprised if one of the majors or, or a large mid-tier companies then comes back and says, you know, this fits our criteria of world class. 
and you're doing 500,000 ounces at below $1,000 an ounce. So incredibly uh, uh, profitable. Uh, mine with a very high growth, and they still continue to do exploration. So this is where we look at it. It's got a market cap now, I think about 1.3, 1.4 billion can Canadian. But compared to comparables around the world, it's still significantly undervalued. And we've got that growth and exploration growth in, in cash. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, did, I did see that the local sort of like government in terms of de- 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 geopolitical risk has just extended the license, hasn't it, by about another 10 years or so? Yeah, it's a poster child for doing business. What we liked is, is uh, the way that they were conducting business. They, they got over the, that was the first step, getting over the social license issues that, that were prevalent in the mm. barrack days. So they, they got the community to be on side. Um, they, they formed a great relationship with the local communities, employing them, and that allowed them to get what you see coming out of this, this company today. Yes, it's a single asset, but again, um, with all the, 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 the backing that they've got from the Papua New Guinea government, we, we're very, very comfortable with the, with the stock. And, and I've got the same screen as Mark on, on, on the <laughs> side there. And um, we, we haven't discounted any of the expiration upside. We're just looking at the cash flows right now. We're looking at the growth of the next couple of years. So the, the momentum in, in cash flow generation, the momentum in expiration uh, upside, and that's notwithstanding any uh, more expiration upside of some of these exciting porphyry targets. That Brilliant. Got, one of the porphyry targets could easily justify double the current share price. So um, we, we like the fact that it still trades at a quite a big discount, even though it's done quite well. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Um, and thanks very much for your insights, gents. Now, just before we finish, though, Mark, I don't, if, a, if an investor wants to sort of put some money into the Amati Strategic Metals Fund, how, how best to do this? I think you'll probably get quite a few interested parties, actually, from what you've just told me. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the, the best way, go on to our website, amatiglobal.com, um, and you'll see all the, the information for registering for the fund uh, under... TB Amati Strategic Metals Fund. And then our, our sales team uh, are, are reachable as well. So um, and all, the, all the information is, there is quite a comprehensive yeah. database on, the, on our website. And Brilliant. also it, it, go, it goes through the philosophy of the fund. Uh, you can see some of our site visits we've been on, uh, some of the newsletters uh, and, uh, and, and thematic pieces that we've put out. We, we, we do quite a comprehensive uh, literature uh, assembly on, on that website. Great. Well, um, very much looking forward to uh, touching base in the six months' time and see how the fund is getting. So we're uh, really well done there, guys, and uh, hope you have a great Christmas. Thank you very much, Paul.